This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with the Managing Director of Buckinghamshire Cricket, Rich Hudson. He discusses the use of statistics with the current England team, the pathway for young cricketers and how Buckinghamshire Cricket supports this, as well as his book, Perform Beyond Pressure, and the learnings that you can take from this. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. So, Rich, uh, appreciate you spending a bit of time with me today. Uh, how are things your end? All good? Yeah, all, all good. Obviously, we're in the off-season of cricket, but we're pretty busy with different uh, winter programmes going on, whether that's in schools or our own player pathway and, and academy. So, um, yeah, it's, it's nice to have had a little bit of a break from the season. But, we, you know, I think like most sports, it's 12 months a year these days. But you just try and balance out what's going on in those 12 months and not... Um, burn anyone out or, or um, make sure they can, particularly players that, and younger players, they get the chance to play the other sports and stuff, and stuff like that. So imagine for you at the minute, same as everyone working from home, enjoying the opportunity to watch a bit of T20 on in the background as well. I don't know if you're doing the same as me, but uh, it's quite nice when I'm writing emails to have that on. Yeah, d- definitely. Obviously, uh, yesterday afternoon was um, uh, England were playing against Sri Lanka. So that was, that was handy. Made sure I had no meetings in yesterday afternoon and just did a bit of admin and it's obviously really nice to see England um, off to a really good start in that in that competition and um, you know just when we're working with with younger players to have the role models in our own country on white ball cricket I think it's so powerful we spent so many years in English cricket sort of trying to play catch up to Australia um, and others and it's great to see people like Josh Butler kind of setting the setting the tone and making that um, very enjoyable but also makes life a little bit easier when you go to work. Yeah, and I think massively it's kind of the brand that they're playing as well. And I know obviously New Zealand kind of started it off with Brendan McCullen and their shift of all brands of cricket being like that. But, you know, when you see Josh Butler, like the innings that he had yesterday and then obviously Jason Roy's done the same, Bairstow's done the same, Stokes, granted not in this tournament, but previously has done the same. It, it's the I think the way that they're going about it, which, you know, will really inspire the younger generations and hopefully they're watching and, Obviously, wanted to get involved. Um, yeah, when yeah. I guess when summer times come around. Yeah, d- definitely. I think if you know someone's yeah, I think when I was growing up, what, what what did cricket look like? If you turn on the TV, and you know, I love the longer form of the game, but I think if you, it just has such a broader reach. The T Twenty, and particularly when your own national team is doing well and you've got your own role models, I think it makes such a difference. And as you say, that kind of like fearless cricket attacking cricket but also I think behind it I think there's a lot of analysis they go on so that their attacking play is really targeted you know they talk a lot about matchups and different players targeting different bowlers or different stages of the innings to maximize their kind of attacking talent and skill that they've got so it's really um, it's really fearless but I also think it's really smart and I think they, the smarter element is probably the bit that's they've developed more and more as the years gone on like you're looking to build up to that to the World Cup that they won in the 50 overs a few years ago I think you know it's probably all out of attack whereas I think they probably got different gears that they can shift through as those as those players now they've probably got a greater range to their games so it kind of just shows how they're evolving even having won a, a World Cup in the 50 over Cup that they're you know a lot of those batters particularly are kind of try to go take up their, their game to another take their game up another gear which is great to see and so why do you think they made that shift in terms of maybe being more analytical and smarter? Like, uh, example, the other day against Australia, I saw that they held Moen Ali out because of Finch and the way that he attacks off spin. Um, what do you think made them make that shift? And then how have, how that you know of, again, how, how have they implemented it um, so successfully? Yeah, I just think that you go back a few years and if you just went all out of attack and you had the skill to do it, then no other teams were playing conservatively enough that that would work more times than not. And I think actually when you watch Australia play a lot now, they're still playing quite orthodox, whether it's T20 or 50 overs, kind of play the percentages quite steadily, raising them and going, well, actually, we're just going to push the accelerator down. And I think for a number of years that was good enough. But actually, 
other teams have caught up and you know you see teams like uh, India aren't having the best run but they've got some such strength and depth of players experience through the IPL so suddenly you need another edge um all you know you're kind of fearless express yourself skillful players it's not enough on its own so you need, you need another edge and I think from what I I mean I don't know personally from what I understand I mean Morgan I think he's quite a just quite an analytical um guy I think he's into his race horsing and um um, horse racing, sorry, and uh, you know, and it, he kind of follows the form and know wants to know who to back, and I think that's similar. You know, they want to know who to back. Well, actually, Moeen against Aaron Finch has been a poor matchup for a number of years. Finch tends to whack him into the stand, so it doesn't matter what Mo, how well Moeen's bowled in the previous games. Actually, against Aaron Finch, there's a better there's a better matchup, um, and that for me is just yeah, I think it's just a need to constantly develop the. Uh, the next the next edge and you've got a, a captain who kind of is good at sifting through that because I, I think it's very easy to get bogged down in data it's how do you how do you make it work for you and and they seem to be able to have got that balance um spot on so far which is um yeah i don't think it's an easy balance to get because either you know i just remember you'd go back to a couple of world cups saying that they were always looking to get past scores because it was motivated by the data Whereas they almost limited themselves with data, whereas now they seem to be using it in a way to exploit their strengths and, and kind of limit the opposition's chance to expose their weaknesses. I think what's been really interesting around that as well, managing it, is how you manage the individuals. So like for Mo and Ali, obviously a start to the tournament had been unbelievable to then kind of say, well, you're actually you're not bowling this game. I know it might not have been an explicit conversation because obviously if Finch had got out early, they may have turned to him. But obviously being in the position where Moen accepts the fact that, OK, yeah, that's a bad matchup for us, but I know that I'll have a good one in the next game or the next couple of games and being happy with that and how, how they manage that internally. I can be, imagine it must be a fascinating conversation to have and, you know, people having defined roles within within the squad and what that looks like. You look at Joss Butler going from middle of order to swapping with Johnny Bairstow. Like, yeah, how they have those conversations and how he obviously goes with evidence, I think is really, really interesting. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a great example, that Bairstow one, because go back a year and people were saying they were getting that wrong, that they shouldn't have switched those guys around. But actually, I think you know, it was a data-driven decision that actually, that, Bairstow is their um, best player of spin and therefore having him batting it in the middle order where spin's always going to be on is going to get the most out of him. And Butler is just their best player, so they want him facing as many balls as possible. And you could easily make the argument the other way around because there's not that much difference uh, to the to the eye, I think, on their ability. But that's, yeah, how they've how they driven that. And that must be, you know, must be challenging. But I also think, second thing, the first time you talk about it, it's the hardest. But actually, if you create a culture where this is how we do it, and you, and someone like Moeen will have seen that have to best. And then you realise it's that it's not about me. It's about you know, it's not about the individual get taking it personally. It's about having the information and then understanding that this is how the team works. Um, I also think what's really interesting within the team is just you know, Morgan is obviously a very strong captain, but just the amount he who he talks to and the amount he talks to players out there, and Moeen is one of them. And so is Chris Jordan and other and, and just about and I think they've opt- they've not just got one really good captain, but I think they've got a number of really good leaders who have got a lot of experience of playing around the world in these T twenty competitions. And it just seems very good at getting drawing that out of them. And someone like Moeen, um, I think he, if he's made to if you, if even if you're not bowling him, if you're going to him and asking about the tactics, the field sets and that sort of stuff, then well, I think like anyone, you feel like you're part of it. You're contributing in different ways. And I think Morgan is very good at, at doing that and making people feel like they, they belong and they're valued in that environment. Um, that's certainly how it looks on the, on the TV. Because I think Jordan's a really interesting one because Jordan, you know, is the England's death bowler bowling at the end of the innings, but statistically not amazing, not, not about, you know, he kind of, he's a banker in that side, but you compare him around the world. He's not that good. But you can see how important he is to Morgan during the fielding innings because it's not just the balls he bowls, but it's his calmness and understanding the order they're going to bowl the different bowlers and the fields they're going to set. Um, and so that, I think, is elevated, has 
elevated Jordan's um, well potentially a sense of belonging and, and interesting that his performance has actually gone up as well so you start to draw complete cause and effect but I, I find that really really interesting for a player that I think few people were doubting numbers wise he's played so well and the way that Morgan interacts with him on the field could be a big part of that. Yeah and I think what you're leading to there is kind of having the best team not necessarily always the best players um, and and this is just my personal preference. Again, I'm no expert in cricket, but Tom Curran for me is one where I feel like when he's played recently, he's got hit about a bit. And I'm always like, why, why, why do you stick with it? That there's other bowlers that you could make the argument that are maybe more effective or, you know, younger players that could come in and potentially, you know, kind of get some exposure and stuff. But there's obviously something that he provides within the group that they value and they, they think that actually, no, we feel like him being here provides us with a good plan B or has this particular skill set or has these experiences. I know he goes out to Big Bash, I believe, and does a lot of stuff T20 there. So it is kind of configuring the best group of individuals, uh, sorry, the best team and not just a group of individuals that go, well, listen, they're all averaging 50. If they all go and smash 50, then not a problem, is it? We'll win the game. It's kind of the nuances in and around that. Yeah, definitely. And how do you get there to dovetail each other? So, you know, you might have someone like Chris Wokes, great bowl at the top of the innings, but it's you also need guys who bowl at the death. And actually, so the roles are now so specific that the same guy is rarely good at both those. So... You know, there's only so many guys they're going to back to bowl the last couple of overs. And Curran, as you told Curran, you know, it might have had a tough run, but actually, who else have they got that's got the experience and the calmness um, to, 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 to do that? Because it's not just a case of, oh, he's a better bowler. It's when you're a better bowler against who, you know, the stage of the game and, and, and that sort of thing. So um, it's... Um, that role clarity and knowing kind of where you are in the packing order for the, for those roles, I think is, is getting so, so specific in T, in T20 cricket in a way that it wasn't, you know, five or 10 years ago. And do you see, I guess this is from a personal perspective, obviously at the moment we were doing very well in white ball cricket, obviously won the 50 over world cup. We're doing well in this one and all, all things being well, we'll, we'll win this one as well. Do you see the, the culture shift between test cricket and white ball cricket? And do you see us being able to balance that out where maybe we're able to have a little bit more success or be well-rounded in, in all three part, or all three formats of the game? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a real tension. It probably has been for a while, isn't it? But um, I think that's definitely the aspiration. It's definitely the way the people at ECB talk. And I think most people in cricket you know, test cricket is, is the pinnacle. And obviously we've got the Ashes coming up. Um, it's going to be an incredibly tough series. And, but I think the desire is to, to balance it. But sometimes, you know, there's just so many different factors going into this. I've just seen, well, one is, so people now see T20 and white ball cricket is something that we're really good at. And I think we've done really well. We kind of know how to develop a player in white ball cricket now. And you can probably get there quicker because just so much of test match cricket is about patience. So patience in your training, patience in your play, patience about maturity, uh, allowing the player time to, to, to develop that. Whereas I think in T20 cricket, it's a lot about power and you can kind of um, strategy for sure. But um, I think you can you can probably get to be an elite level white ball cricketer quicker than a, tech, a longer format player. So um, that's... You know, so what, what is a player going to choose to do and where does a coach's attention go? I think that's really, really hard. Um, I also just think sometimes you just have a group of players who all come through and they're all, they're all kind of good at the same thing and you build that strength and depth of the white ball cricket. And then, you know, in, in 10 years time, you might have a load of good test match players. Like sometimes, sometimes things are cyclical and you kind of, you want to create a, a kind of a cause and effect, but sometimes it's just the natural order of things that, you're not going to be amazing at everything all the time, no matter how hard you um, how hard you try. So you should enjoy the white ball success whilst it lasts, because you know it might not last it might not last forever. Um, but you know, then you look at the, the, the schedules as always a challenge in English cricket. How much cricket do we play, and, and how do you get the guys playing the right amount of cricket for longer formats? 
when it doesn't you know sell as well as the hundred would domestically so there's a lot of factors that create that um that tension but i don't think people's aspirations have changed that test cricket is just as important it's just it's not the bit that we're excelling in as, as to the same extent at the minute I think that's a really interesting point, kind of what comes through. You look at Australia, you know, when they had that side of Warren, Gilchrist, McGrath and stuff and all came through and almost unbeatable. And then obviously you have Michael Clark who came in a little bit younger, but came in fit really good. And then slowly as those guys start to retire, it then kind of became more challenging for them. And obviously England are like, doing a similar thing where we had that Ashes team of Harmerson, Flintoff, Peterson, Vaughan. But then slowly, as that they retired, we found it more challenging. I, I I don't know if there's research on this. I'd be really interested to see how kind of, I guess, modern society affects it as well. If you you talk about the like work around like Instagram or TikTok and everything being fast and you know quick paced and whatnot, that's almost the antidote to what a good Test match player is. They, you know. If you have the thing, you've got a test match player probably needs to be able to read a novel and read a book, whereas uh, a T20 player can kind of flip through TikTok type thing for a thing. So I wonder whether there is any correlation in terms of actually what culture and modern society looks like to then how that then affects, you know, mindsets of just children growing up, which then affects them actually in competition, not necessarily what's being taught but actually how the culture then affects the cricket inside yeah d definitely I, th I think that's i think that's true and i think you know it's the easy the shorter the format the more accessible it is the more it's easy to earn big money quickly it's more appealing for to a, to a spectator or a, a young player you know without putting much thought into it so that's that's always going to be a challenge but i think so, you know, within cricket, it's called test cricket for a reason. It's because it's the hardest thing. And I think there's a natural bit of everyone that wants to see how good they really are. And I think the longer format is that for, for most players. And it's really going to stretch all aspects of their game. So I think, I think their desire to, to be good at test cricket is, is, is there. It will have to continually be um worked on to make sure that it still appeals to players and broadcasters and fans and so on but i think to get a good test match team it's i think again i think it's just harder you need more you look at someone like graham swan how good an off spinner he was how good a spin ball he was which we didn't really have and he was a good batter and he was a good catcher in the slips you think well we didn't have someone unless i'm forgetting we didn't have someone like him for 20 years before and we haven't had someone like him for the, you know, the eight years since. And he, he wasn't a warm, but he was a brilliant player to balance that team. Um, and you need the depth in batting. You know, that Ashes we won out in Australia, you had, um, you know, Ian Bell at five and Collingwood at six. And you think, well, they'd be three and four now. And it's just, you have to get a lot of things all come together at the same time to, to be a really, to be, to be a really good, test team and you can only hope that having had some more challenging times recently there's enough people around at the top level thinking worked out what you know one thing they also like you know what it takes to win what what in the 50 over competition they said right we need two attacking openers we need a number three who can score hundreds and so on i'm sure they've done all the research on test cricket what it takes to win and but it may take a little bit of time to get to that point where you've got those 11 players of that skill and experience or all coming together um and you know england aren't too far away i don't think particularly when you get stokes back um and if you've got archer back then you you're not a million miles away and we'll come on to this a bit later but it's about obviously performing under pressure which i know you've written a book on which you kindly sent to me and we'll discuss a bit later on but it's being able to do that as well you know in, in the front of the cameras in front of the bright lights and down under this year being able to pull all the all the learning all the thing together it is small margins of, of test cricket you know being half an inch the wrong way or half an inch you're back in the right position that, that can be the difference between getting out or not getting out so um 
Yeah, really interesting. Right, I'll stop quizzing you about the England thing from the outside now. So, obviously, for people that probably may have guessed you work within cricket, but for people that maybe don't necessarily know you or haven't come across you, etc., do you just want to explain what your role within cricket is and what that actually entails from a practical point of view? Yeah, so my, my role is managing director of Buckinghamshire Cricket. So we've got 40 or 39 counties, I think, in the country, um, uh, 18 professional teams and then 21 called national national counties. So kind of all have um, adult men's and women's teams, but ours are sort of non-professional. And we've all got pathways that start at, uh, under 11s and go all the way through boys and boys and girls. Um, <clears throat> But ultimately, when they get to about 16, 17, we're looking to get them onto the academies of the of the pro teams. And then those that aren't quite good enough for that, they'll come through and play for our for our senior seniors teams. And obviously, those that get onto the academies of the pro teams may come back and play for us as well, or you know, may drop out of the professional out of the professional game. So our natural partners for in um, in boys and men's cricket is Northamptonshire. So we're they are border and county. So. We'll play, we'll compete against them all the way through, but then, like, yeah, a lad gets to 17, say, hopefully he gets onto North Hans's academy. And then in the women, it's a slightly different structure, um, that there's eight regional teams, um, set out and we, we feed into the Southern Vipers, which is the, this team based down in, in, uh, Southampton. And again, trying to get players onto, onto their academy and then through to their first team. But so that's the kind of the pathway, but then it's also, clubs it's schools and it's um kind of urban and diverse community projects and how do we get new people playing the game how do we you know, cricket for good for social good how do we enhance people's lives or um, work with communities and sort of cricket as the as the vehicle so it's kind of a real wide wide remit i guess in terms of um yeah cricket from trying to produce a professional player through to trying to get a five-year-old playing a game or a mother of the, you know, trying to play women's cricket for the, for the, for the first, for the first time. Um, and that's my main role, but then I also, I'm a, a level four coach and a um, background in uh, psychology. So, um, I currently sort of consult for a couple of the, the pro teams on the, on the psychology, on the psychology front, which is kind of nice to have the variety. Having not played professionally myself, I kind of always thought I needed a couple of strings to my bow to to have opportunities to open up. So I was kind of coaching and doing psychology stuff. Went got more into the coaching um, part, path, and then I guess the administration of the games kind of become more my the route I've kind of got, gone into. But it's kind of at the minute I do a bit of them all, but primarily I'm paid to be a good administrator. But I also I coach one of our age group teams, and I you know, I do site with um, some of the some of the pro um, squads. So um, yeah, a real nice a real nice variety in in the game, and kind of see it at all different levels, which is um, kind of very helpful. I think to you see the big picture, and, and when things aren't working, you kind of you you've got a variety of angles to kind of look at that and try and, and improve programs and and coaches and players and and, and develop things further. So yes, yeah, that's a re obviously really interesting dynamic and the diversity you've got with, within roles and stuff. So if we, if we look at it from the, I guess, the base level, when you're looking to get individuals into the sport um, and looking to obviously begin them on their journey, how do you go around making sport accessible to those individuals? What type of pathways do you put in place to try and encourage them to one, play, and then obviously two, hopefully kind of stay with it within your club and work their way up and progress in that area yeah so we have a primary schools program which is funded by a charity called chance to shine um and, and ecb kind of fund them to, and then allow us to go to go and deliver so we'll deliver in about sort of 50 primary schools in across buckinghamshire um a year and we try and map those schools to clubs with, with junior sections uh, and particularly with the ECB, ECB have got a couple of national programs called All Stars, which is for five to eight year olds, and Dynamo's Cricket for eight to eleven year olds softball, softball cricket. So the, the the objective is to go into schools and do the players, and then they'll join their local clubs, All Stars and and Dynamo's um, programs, and then kind of stay in their clubs uh, through that. I think 
the challenge. So that I think that's working really well. I think the gain at the bottom end is is in a really healthy position. I think the challenge is always as you get a little bit older, teenagers dropping out of the game. How do you engage them? What variety of offers do you need to have to to keep them involved? And also, I, th- I think as a, as a game, we've, we've we're getting better, but we tend to go to hard ball too quickly and. That I think that's great if you kind of got some aptitude for it, but it could be quite daunting. And actually, just playing softball cricket, whacking a ball with a bat, like almost creating that backyard cricket at cricket clubs, um, and trying to create a pathway almost all the way through. Now, if you're a, you know, um, mums and dads of a junior player, or just you know local people that you know, you could actually go and play on a Friday evening, and you could just play cricket. But you don't have to strap the pads on. You don't have to bowl the hard ball making the game more accessible. I think there's quite a bit more work to be done to that, to that, that you don't have to make such a big commitment in terms of time and equipment and developing skill of playing hardball, which is so different to playing with a softball. But everyone could bowl over arm, whack a ball, run around fielding. And that's, that's fun. But I think as a game, we've, we haven't done enough to create that kind of pathway there. So, 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 I think there's some really good progress being made, but there's, there's a lot to be done to keep people in, in the game and, and kind of have diverse offers that don't just um, work for the, the same people that it's always worked for. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. I, I think that I remember being at school, actually, I was quite a sporty kid growing up and then kind of that first day where they're like, oh yeah, you need to start putting pads and helmets and stuff on. And you're like, oh, okay. So it's like, it's kind of almost getting like serious a little bit now, but it was also like for me because I just love sport really interesting but I can imagine for a few people they're like right I'm out at this point you know get one hit on the hand where you're a little bit close and it stings you're like this isn't for me all of a sudden so I think that's a really um really interesting point and trying to funnel those people up and trying to keep them engaged in terms of ways you do that so when when they do begin to get into I guess secondary school age and you're looking at the 11s and you mentioned around them obviously them being county size and you play into county how are you funneling people into that? And what are maybe some of the key identifiers for individuals where you go, okay, they may have potential to be within this framework? Yeah, so how, how it works, in Bucks we've got, we've got about 45 junior um, sections. So they nominate to, to us as a county in the, in sort of the middle of the summer. And then the, all those players get a couple of opportunities to kind of come and play um, well, we sort of they play games and they go in the nets and they get the kind of it's a trial, but we try and take that trial element, the feel of it being a trial away, and create a really enjoyable experience playing cricket for a few hours against other good players from around the county. And the end of it, yes, some players will be selected, but we kind of want that experience in itself to be a positive one, um, and to increase the awareness of players of where they match up against each other. You know, particularly with teenagers, they they know. Um, but you need to give them the experiences so they kind of know where they are. They do fit in that in that um, in that pecking order. And then we take around about thirty players at every age, from 11s to 18s, boys and girls, and kind of then they come into our coaching programs through the winter, and then um, in, in in then play through the through the summer. So we try and keep the pool of players relatively big for as long as we can without diluting the offer. The quality of the product, that the quality of the programs for the players that are in there. So, you know, you could, we want to, we want to create opportunity, but ultimately every time you come, it needs to be a good experience. So if you put more and more players in there, then all of a sudden coach ratios aren't very good or they get less game time and that sort of thing. So we're constantly battling that sort of tension, not to, not to go too narrow, um, t- too soon. We, we particularly find that. Um, let's say under the gap, under 13 is a really interesting year because, particularly for boys, because puberty really kicks in then and a really good 13 year old cricketer might not be a 50, really good 15 year old cricketer and vice versa because of just the natural. Well, I think there's three things. There's probably perhaps private school cricket, um, it dominates in the, the younger age groups just through time and task that those kids, so at under 11s, you could bet that most of the best players go to independent schools because they, um, they've just done more of it. By the time you're 15, that's often balanced out. 
And what you see is the players who are there at 50, they've kind of got more of a love and a passion for the game. And outside of their county stuff, they've probably got a real commitment to their club cricket. Because what we see at 15, 16 is that if they're playing really good adult club cricket on a Saturday, that that will really accelerate their their learning because they're playing with adult players who might not necessarily be technically as skilled, but they're obviously all their experience, their their strategy, um, and that environment just gets players to mature um, ma- massively. Um, so yeah, so the the prep school element comes into it. I think the love of the game um, is is really really key, and then just yeah, some people grow. Like if you're going to be a fast bowler, the physicality comes into it, and some people you know just have that big growth spurt and all of a sudden they they um they come through but what you kind of hope is that well we kind of hope that we've kept our, our programs open enough that they would have received the coaching to create the fundamentals that when that growth spurt comes through and they might jump ahead of 10 of their peers that they can maximize it because even if they weren't the best player at 12 their their kind of alignment as a you know as a bowler is all about energy transfer to the to the other end of the to, to the batter. So if you've got a really effective energy transfer as a 12 year old, even if your body's not there yet, then you have your big growth spurt. You still got the really effective technique in terms of energy transfer. Then you're going to get great outcomes. So we've got to make sure we get those fundamentals into players, but you have to allow the individual factors that are going to balance it out to kind of come through. And, and you know, physicality is one of it. Love of the games, um, another, and kind of commitment to playing in yeah playing your adult cricket and not just um you know, whether it's adult cricket or just other environments where it's, it's challenge and you know there's there's a, a certain amount of failure um or uncomfortable you know it's uncomfortable enough that there's, there could be a bit of growth um as a, as a person through that yeah and obviously i guess at the younger ones when you are looking at um selection or decision or whatever that looks like there's gonna be a level of technical and tactical side to it. So if you're looking at identification on in that context, what type of things are you looking for your players to be able to do or potentially be able to do with the support of your staff? Yeah. So I think it changes through, but I guess there's you're looking at some outcomes and you're looking at some processes, aren't you? So in terms of outcomes, you know, can you strike the ball cleanly? Does the ball go, you know, can it go to the boundary? And I think sometimes in cricket before we've looked too much at the process, like have they got really nice technique and not enough that actually is the outcome good. And I uh, it's not one or the other. I think you've got to hold them both in in, in um, together because somebody might get a really good outcome now, but against better bowling or against you know um as they get older, will they still be able to achieve that outcome given the the fundamentals of their technique? So a uh, fundamental technique, I think, you know, for a batter is kind of, you know, it's like this balance. How do your head, hands and feet kind of align as you set up and move into the ball? Um, and it's um, and, and also a kind of alignment. So you know, cricket's often quite a side on sort of game and you can get into better positions if you start relatively s- s- side on. There are obviously some individual difference there, but if you've got your hips pointing off in one direction, your feet pointing off in another direction, and someone rolls an 80 mile an hour ball at you, it's going to be quite hard to, to access it. So getting yourself in positions where you can access the ball um, more, more regularly, and then can you kind of hit through the line of the ball? So, you know, the, we could all kind of generate force by having a big swing across, but you're not going to, you're going to miss a lot of balls. So can you actually, do you have the, the, the technique to kind of hit through the ball with a pretty straight bat and get the ball going back past the past the bowler. Um, so they're kind of some of the yeah the, fun, the fundamentals. But I uh, and outcomes. And I work with under 15, so I just think well, okay, as a batter, I'm looking at do you have really clear boundary options so of every type of bowler that comes on? Could you hit them before? Um, and that might sound really simple, but most can't once you you go out of that level of of, of, of country cricket. They might be able to hit a really bad ball before, but can you hit a goodish ball before? Then do they run properly, run really well between the wickets? So again, a lot of club and school cricket, you don't have to run well between the wickets because um, you'll score enough of bad balls that it doesn't get shown up. Um, and then uh, such a key thing is playing against spin. And the reason that is, is 
because there's no pace on the ball. So all of a sudden, it makes it harder to play high um, high percentage shots for relatively low risk. So can you find a way, do you have the skill set to score off spin bowling? Because you might face it for an hour. They might not bowl a bad ball. There's going to be very little pace to work with. So what are your, how are you going to solve that? Solve solve that problem. And so, when you mention about the, the the cleanness of contact, for example, um, is there any ways for you to actually measure that in terms of any software, etc., or is that more of a subjective uh, point of view? Yeah, I mean, we do measure um, sort of the like bowling speeds, the you know, speed off the bat, so how hard somebody can um, strike the ball. But I think more often than not, it is subjective, and it's it's just you're trying to put that into a game context and you're trying to observe and go okay, against this bowler. You know, does he play a nice looking shot that goes 20 yards straight to a fielder or can they really accelerate their hands through the ball and the ball goes? So, you, you know, you could, you could measure that uh, objectively, but most of the time you can kind of, you can kind of tick that off. Is do they have that option? You know, do they have the capacity to get the ball from A to B? A relative relative consistency in in a in a game sort of either in a game or a game scenario within 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 training and um we don't me- we don't measure that number because i'm not there's a danger i think that you it might lack context and uh, i think you know often in, in cricket you know the the right shot at the right time is is important but we just want to know does he have the capacity to strike it cleanly at the right, you know, if the opportunity presents itself? And then when you're looking at, um, you, you mentioned kind of around that their alignment and stuff, which I think is a really interesting one. How do you manage those two factors? So you might have an individual who strikes it very, very cleanly, but at the moment has you know all the triggers under the sun in terms of they're a bit quirky with their back lift they're a bit quirky when they move their head isn't necessarily in the right position um and then obviously you guys probably identify that at the moment it works but in five years time i think against a quick in in swinger this is going to cause problems because he's outside the line all the time so how do you go around challenging that individual to kind of break down the technique where they're going to maybe lose some of their success at the time being to hopefully build it up in a slightly different way that is going to be more positive for them in the long term yeah i mean everything described there is definitely the, the challenges that we have with with lots of players i think video is the best the best tool so you know lots of players they might have achieved success in club and, and school cricket but they might never have seen themselves on video and it's very easy for us to you know, we try and keep that really simple. Or I do sort of a couple of phases of the, so like what, where they are, let's say for a batter, when the ball releases the ball, what's their position? And then as they move to the ball, what's their position? As they make contact with the ball, what's the position? Uh, and then, then kind of how do their, yeah, align, alignment, you know, whether it's horizontally or vertically of the body, how do they align? It's going to make it more like, less likely for them to, to hit the ball. And I think most players, and you can map that up against then a video of, uh, other test players and where they are there you, just, you know it's very easy to pull something off youtube and go well you know baby de villiers you know joe root etc they're all here you're here and i think most players will get that in that moment and we don't often have a hard task getting them to understand it but the, the task then is how disciplined is their practice going to be in the what exactly what you said is how much current success are they prepared to lose to get future success and that's the real challenge. And I think that's about your coach player relationship. Um, it's about, um, being really patient, getting them to be really patient, I guess, because I just think so many of the technical work is about slowing it down and building it back up. And it can be quite boring, I guess. Uh, certainly not as fun as swinging off, swinging as hard as you can and trying to send the ball miles with a, with a poor technique. So getting them to, to slow down and then. I think really you're also hoping they've got the mindset that they're going to go away and both practice this in their own time, but also be mindful of it when they're in other environments. So that when they go back into their club cricket, they're not just thinking about the end result, but they're also thinking about 
they're mindful of the positions, the quality of the positions they're getting into in those other environments. As we find as county coaches, you know, we see these players, you know, across a year, we might see them you know, 25, 30 times. Um, and you're not going to have the same conversation on every occasion with them. So there is a lot that we require. It's not like a football academy where you'll see your players a lot more. We require those players to go into their other environments, particularly their club ones, take the feedback and um, apply it, which is dangerous. You know, you, you haven't got so much control over it, but I think it also shows you who's got the um, that, that, that mindset to actually take control of their own game and, and take responsibility for their own development. And ultimately, I think if someone in cricket doesn't have that characteristic, they're going to be limited in the long run because that the game is continually showing up your technique. You know, you look at an England player, same with you know, Dominic Sibley, he's a good example of a player whose technique might have got shown up a bit in test match cricket. Well, the only way he's going to get better is if he takes responsibility for that and goes away and does the boring, patient work, reshaping that so it is ready. And we need to, we try and instill that in players from that, you know, particularly from the teenage years upwards, that that process is it's led by us in terms of information, but it's over, it's reliant on them to do the graft to make the difference. And if they don't want to, then that's their call. And if they, if they don't want to do the work and they're still good enough to play for us, then you know, that's nothing against them. It's their game at the end of the day. So it's not for me to say that every player should play the way I want them to play. Um, but here's the information, make the most of it that they can. Um, and then, you know, hopefully they'll get the outcomes, the outcomes they want. And do you manage the relationship between the clubs? So say, for example, you've got a, a, a right-handed batsman that, you know, goes for all these triggers, but is very good at accessing the ball on the leg side. And you're saying to him, listen, you, you need to have some scoring options on the offside. Otherwise, this isn't going to be sustainable moving forward. And you try to put a plan in place for him to facilitate back at his club of accessing the ball on the offside more regularly. Do you tell the coaches in the the club team that or is that put down to the player to have that conversation and how's that kind of information passed and, and gathered on etc yeah it was a really good really good question because we're having this discussion exactly this morning as the club had kind of raised that with us and it's not something we've we've got particularly well um nailed down and there's a few different reasons we've got 300 players in the pathway and um trying to trying to get getting it right for what it looks like outside of our environment is is a is a big task for i think it's one of our key work ones so i think we've, we've done a hell of a lot of work on what's it how good is it in our environment but actually as we you know i was just explained actually we're very reliant on what it goes on outside and that's that's what we need to do i think the the challenge is that every club is very very different and they're coaching resources so you often find that let's say a 15 year old county player whether he's got technical challenges or not when he goes back to his club he's probably successful but he's also he's not their coach's biggest concern because he's getting success so they're worried about supporting players who aren't getting that amount of success so it's quite um it's just quite a tricky field to navigate that actually not in all clubs do they have the coaches that are there for either individual development almost like best best of their best players development that is to that their coaches are kind of focused on the i think as often coaches can be on kind of the middle of getting the average better rather than those best players and i think we want to work with our you know, it's probably sort of 10 12 clubs who are kind of the standout ones so working with those so they've got almost like an academy within the club that they, if they, if we've got, they've got six county players that they offer academy type coaching to them with our, um, with some of the information that we can provide to them. Um, but that's, you know, that's sort of something we're looking at for 2022. Um, and we'll be interested to know, you know, if other clubs, other sports have done that well, how, how they do it. We're, we're happy to take the learnings and apply them if, if they're out there. <coughs> Sorry about that. There's an interesting one. I had a podcast with um, uh, Greg Mannion, who's actually at Leicester Tigers, and they have a very similar issue with the, their pathway. And basically, he 
they put it really solely on the kids. Mm. <laughs> they almost provide it with the resource. And he, what he was saying was, you know, we have Steve Borthwick come down for sessions to, to talk with the lads. So for them to feel comfortable enough to talk to an England international about their game and what they need to work on and stuff, they need to be comfortable enough to talk to their best mate's dad about it or whoever's taking the team. So their IDP plan, which they'll draw together, is put the emphasis on on the kids and try and say to them, listen, this is going to benefit you. Your It's your journey, not ours. Can you be the one that's going to really encourage them at your club to facilitate it as well? Um, but yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to see what you do in that space because I think it's an interesting dynamic of how you support the players or how you support the club to support the players and what the percentage of that looks like. Um, when it goes to the top end, so you were getting to the age where you mentioned that you're going to try and uh, potentially pass these players on to Northamptonshire, etc. Um, are there any key indicators? any key indicators for players that may be successful in making that jump and how does an individual's fit I guess to the club fit as well so like this again I'm just using random examples here if you've got a spinner who's playing on a track that very rarely spins and is really good for seam bowlers he might not that might not be the best place for him to go as an individual so what key indicators do you have and how do you manage kind of the individuals and what's best for them and their longer term potential development? Yeah, if I take those questions in, re in reverse, I think the key thing for us to say are our primary sort of partnership is with North Ants, but we'll work with players and counties of any of the 18 and what's the right outcome for that player. So if, if a player lives right in the south of Berks, and it's better for them to go to Middlesex because of the location or he gets scout, scouted somewhere else and they'd like him and that works for them. And that's great. So we've got players, well, we've got a lad who's just completed his first year on the pro staff at Gloucestershire. We've got a lad who played for England under 19, so he's at Hampshire. And then we've got, um, you know, one, one of the pro staff at Northampton and four on the academy there. So it's about what's finding right for the player. But what we want is a, a real, a clearly defined, option a that if everything rolls through the pathway naturally this you would end up with more fans but if it's not the right place for you because of whatever reason then we'll work with you and with other counties to provide the um to get you the opportunities to, that you kind of you you deserve so that you know probably about five years ago we had two really good wiki keepers and both were kind of on north Ants's, um you know, sort of on our programs and on theirs and they they signed one, and so the other lad, they were interested in him, and but kept supporting him. But then Gloucestershire kind of came in and said, "No, you'll be top of our academy wicket keeping sort of queue." So, so he signed for Gloucestershire. So it's just a, so it's about yeah, it's just trying to have the the option A there for them, but not being wedded to it, as you say that if you've got if you've got you know if you've got if, if someone's got three spinners ahead of you and you're a spinner. Well, you, that might not be the place for you to go. So where else is needed? And that's just having sort of the conversations with the players, the parents and other counties. And we want to see our players go on. So we'll happily go and bang any doors down that we need to, where we feel we've got a player good enough um, if he's not being seen or not rated in that environment. Because every you know, every academy sees it differently in terms of what they, they value. And you put two batters in front of two different coaches. They'll, they'll have different opinions and so we feel it's important to keep those doors open in terms of the markers i think um i, th I think it's a range it's, it's, it's a balance of things and you so sometimes you you have players with a really strong a super strength almost that they can do something that no other player at that age can do so there may be other areas of the game where they're really really weak in comparison to their peers but that super strength is worth them being signed up you know whether that is um you know often it's probably a power element i think that really stands out if you've got a, so a 16 year old who can hit the ball out of the ground well there aren't many 16 year olds who can do that or you know 16 year old who can bowl 75 mile hour plus and if there are other elements of their game that aren't there you the academy will need to work on them over the years but they'll be enough to get them in the door because it's so far ahead of their peers in terms of what they can produce. Um, so that that super 
straight. But for those players that perhaps don't have that, they're just more rounded players. The difference is, um, I think it's, it's having a second skill that's good. So you're batting, bowling, fielding. But if you're a really good batter, that's great. But what's your what's your fielding like, or can you can you bowl? So have you got more string sh- strings to your bow? You know, look at you know, Moen Ali's a great example, isn't he? Where England kind of know went to the conversation earlier that if he doesn't bowl, that's fine because he's going to be able to bat. And if he if he doesn't bat and he doesn't bowl, which he didn't really yesterday, well, they'll take a really good catch for us. Um, so having that that range of that range of skills, and I think you know, there's a hell of a lot of people who particularly bat, well, batters and bowlers who probably didn't focus on their fielding so much in the past and their athleticism. And that's just so changed so much now. So I, uh, being an athletic mover in the field and doing the strength and conditioning um, work is, I think, is a differentiator. And then so the, the the final piece of that jigsaw is probably the bit I'm most interested in terms of mindset and maturity and the kind of the factors about taking, well, I would think the key ones are taking responsibility for their own development. When it goes wrong, are they looking to learn or are they looking to make excuses or um, blame others? And just the level of maturity of that person, I just think cricket's a brutal game. There's so much failure in it that, um, and you, you have so much time to stew on your mistakes. You know, in a first class game, you might, you might get out first thing on the first day and then not have the chance to bat again for another two days after that. So you've got a hell of a lot of time to think about your mistakes. And that's, I think, to work through that and kind of be able to take success and failure in, in a real balanced way, in a mature way, is, 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 is really important. Whereas, um, you know, kids who have been successful can tend to get caught up in their success and start and perhaps to define themselves by their success and then be afraid of failure, afraid of not looking to learn. Whereas somebody's kind of got that more all in all in balance, you can kind of see them riding out the rough periods, I think I think's um, really important. But there's no you know, it's technical, tactical, physical, mental, isn't it? And what you're looking for is um some strengths in those, no huge weaknesses, and the desire to improve all elements of that and the kind of an understanding that what's got them to that point is great, but what gets them to the next point is a lot more. Yeah, when you said athleticism, I just have uh, images of Inzaman Al Hack running up and down the wicket. You compare that to like Johnny Bairstow now, it's a yeah, completely different game in terms of um, what it looks like. So I think that gives a really good indicator as an oversight as to you know what, what that pathway and journey looks like. I guess for me, this links into what you put, they're there going into pressurised situations. You know, they're going into performance cultures. And whilst, yeah, there is development as part of academy setups or as part of second teams, as part of going into first teams, et cetera, whatever that looks like, you're obviously getting to put the top end where there is an element of pressure being a, a, a revolving around how that individual can perform on a, Day to day, week to week, over to over basis, whatever that looks like. So, from your perspective, and obviously, as we said earlier, you've written a book on this. What are some of the um, indicators for individuals that might be able to cope with that pressure when they go into that environment? Are there any, or are there any particular strategies they can use to try and hopefully um, be successful or deal with the failure when they're in that environment? Yeah, I think one of the key indicators for me, if you're taking someone that you've never worked with, um, is that love of the game. And the reason I say that is because, you know, I think you're probably in the performance, it's always, are you driven more by just sheer enjoyment of doing it? Or is it the kind of need to uh, prove yourself and kind of that more ego driven um, aspect? And whilst you know, there's plenty of ego oriented sort of athletes really successful out there, I think that's much harder. And therefore, if someone really loves the game, then I just I just think that when it goes wrong, they're not going to be as affected by it because they're not going to take it so personally, and they will um, they want to to learn and they want to get better because they want to they want to get better at the game. So they're not so worried about proving themselves. It's a kind of a never ending kind of learning learning cycle of like okay, it's almost like their results are more like feedback than they are as sort of defining outcomes. So they kind of got a 
yeah sense of perspective that I think just a real love of the game um, can, can help. So it can be sound a bit fluffy, but I just think yeah, cricket can be brutal. There's a hell of a lot of failure. So if you actually love it, then I think it makes I think it makes a big difference than someone who thinks oh yeah I kind of like this. I mean you know it's a long day, isn't it? A game of cricket. You can be fielding for seven hours. You've got to um, you've got you, you you've got to have your heart and soul in it. I think and um, I think that's I think that's really important. I think you know perspective is is the key, and, and what I mean by that is, is just not getting caught up in short term results. You know, as I say, as a batter, you could get a string of low scores, but yet can you kind of keep you calm, not try and change every technique that you've ever had, um, and you just kind of trust your skills and trust your strengths to come back out the other side. And if you get caught, if you get too caught up in short termism i think cricket can really screw with your mind but you've got to look at the big picture that actually um you know through some your form will click back into place you know you've got to be aware have real self-awareness of your of your game and so you're not trying to you know you don't have two bad days and then all of a sudden you try and change the way you hold the bat or the way you stand you know you kind of if you're doing that it's because it's part of a natural ongoing sort of journey that would have you would have done that anyway, whether you scored a hundred, you know, I think a good measure of players, if they scored a hundred in the last game, do they go to the nets and do they try and keep getting better? Or do they rest on it? And similarly, if they get if they got zero in the last game, do they try and change everything they've done? Or do they just keep trying to do they go to the nets and keep trying to get better? Because that's what they would do whether they got zero or hundred. So I guess how how much of their practice behaviours are determined by short-term results, I think, is really, um, really, really key. And I think that's why that perspective and of seeing the big picture that it's not the end of the world, I've had a bad day yesterday, but I've got to keep trying to get better either way. I think, I think they're really, they're really key things that you're looking at with players, because I think that's not, although they're things you can develop, I think they're personal, but they definitely are things you can develop, but I think, if someone walks in the door with those attributes, I think it gives you a hell of a lot to work with. And then, you know, in terms of trying to what I would, somebody feels really under pressure in that environment or really struggling in that environment. I think the, the key things I always suggest, the first one is to always to try and split the inner and the outer. So the way that you feel inside from what's happening on the outside. So what I mean by that is I've never seen pressure. I've never looked on a field and seeing pressure, I've only felt it on the inside. So pressure doesn't exist on the outside, it only exists on the inside. So when I'm feeling pressure, it's because I've got a, a load of thoughts that are telling me about how important something is or how bad it will be when I fail. So the pressure is created by, by thoughts. It's not created by the game or other people the, the, or the amount of challenge in the environment. All those things, you know, have the, have the challenges inherently, but they don't create the way that you feel. The way you create, the way you feel is created by the thoughts you've got at that moment in time, which are constantly coming and going. And therefore you can start to separate the way you feel from what's going on outside of you. And it doesn't mean you're going to feel great all the time, but it creates a bit of space. And also I think the, and the next thing that creates space is kind of being able to separate yourself from your, thoughts so kind of like almost like mindfulness that you can kind of see that it's not I feel angry it's that I'm experiencing an angry feeling or I've got a load of thoughts going on that are making me feel angry so that you're separating yourself from this ex internal experience and that creates space and therefore with space you kind of you know Victor Frankl has said between stimulus and response there's a um, there's there's a choice and wherever you've got space, then you can choose. Do I keep going with all these thoughts and keep energizing them? Or do I just ignore them, let them, let them come and let them come and go and not get so caught up in them? So getting space between you and your thoughts, but also then getting space between your thoughts and the outside is the outside world does not create how you feel. It just looks like it does. Okay. So there's loads to unpick there, which is really, really cool. So in terms of trying to create that space from the internal dialogue so yeah if, if you look at it in a context where someone's feeling frustrated by performance um because they're 
maybe they've gone to the Ashes, they're struggling a little bit, it's the third test and they've got out for another relatively low score and they're beginning to get frustrated. How do you go around creating space between that feeling of frustration where you don't self-identify and go, I'm feeling frustrated, it's the context that's making me feel frustrated. How do you go around creating that separation between the two? Yeah, well, I think the first thing, particularly if you've got a player who's who is in that that space themselves, is actually the first thing is not trying to fix it when they're in that low space because actually that's often makes things worse. You know, I think we've all been there where we, um, you know, you the classic thing of someone being really angry and trying to calm down, and it has the opposite effect because they're not mentally in a space to to hear that. So you you've got to allow people the physical time and space to get them for their, um, you know, for that real uh, intense frustration or whatever it is to kind of subside because it, it will, because we all know that no feeling lasts, no matter how you feel at any moment in time, it doesn't, it doesn't last. And actually it's really natural for, you know, feelings to come and go all the time, like good and good and bad. That's just, that's just the natural kind of state of being, human but so it's trying to pick your moment I think to to, to talk to, to a player about it but um as, as in, a, in a sort of coaching um or management sort of role but then once you know you you with with them how do you create that space well it's it's about knowing that that is true so it's a bit like um you know if I say well this is the way you hit a ball as a batter from A to B that's great but you've done no practice on that to make that happen so you have to kind of commit to saying so you have to believe me that this is the best way for you to get that ball from A to B and then you have to to undergo whatever practice it takes to get there so I guess that first thing is when you know, somebody you would for an individual to recognize that I am not my thoughts I am not my feelings therefore I am something that is separate from the way that I think and the way that I feel and somebody has to recognise that there's a truth in that. Um, because if they don't, then it's not going to go anywhere. And once you have uh, recognised the truth in that, then they've got to do, I'm not saying the practice, but you've got to go on that process. Like, you know, life's not full of quick fixes. So, and I think the the, you know, the best way, is it's, an, it's an inner one, where every time you, you um, get caught up in your thinking, you kind of, start to realize that shit that or part, part of my French but that's not it's not the outside world that's the major problem here it's the amount of thinking I'm doing about it and that's always true that actually every situation looks worse the more you more you overanalyze it and the more you think about it and you start to catch yourself you start to catch yourself perpetuating pretty negative um emotional states just because you you're adding more fuel to the fire you're adding more thinking to it and you're kind of handle, trying to analyze your way out of low fear and every time you catch yourself you just kind of let it go and that's the key is just letting go of of that of that of that thought and so you kind of you just kind of get yourself in the space and i've gone for a personal i guess journey of it of being someone who's perhaps overly analytical to, to almost weaning myself off the addiction to think everything to the amount that it an overuse of analytical thinking that kind of breeds frustration and, and burnout and um and you know and all, all sorts of negative states so you're you're just trying to you're just trying to catch yourself and you're just trying to break the habit um of where your thinking is making that worse and then i think you know it's like anything well how do you practice it well i think if that's something that you think is really important then you you, you know, talk to somebody through about your experiences and how um you know and, and almost give yourself space to kind of think through how you might have dealt with that better but it's also reading or listening to stuff that kind of talks to that that's educational in the same way that you talk to a coach that's educational about how to how to hit ball so it's not like there's a, a magic bullet but I think there's a it's a recognition of a truth and then starting a journey to kind of create space yes space between your thoughts and feelings that you are not that and therefore there's a big question on well then what who who am i and understanding yourself and then yeah creating that space between the outside and the inside so don't assume that the way that you feel is coming from what's happening in the world 
because the person next to you feels very differently about what's happening in the world. And that's because they've got completely different thinking to the thinking you've got going on. So understanding that kind of thought is the center of your world and that you can change your relationship with the way that you think is, um, I think, just starts a process off and then that process can go in many different ways. One thing you said there was around the burnout side, and I think it's becoming more and more prevalent in high end sport of athletes taking breaks. You look at, you know, Ben Stokes at the moment, it's a decision on his part to take a bit of time away. Do you think that that is partly down to this inability to almost separate himself from Stokesy, the cricketer, and actually look at it and go, oh, this is almost a, you know, Stokesy, when I turn up at a game, yeah, I might be analytical of how I'm going to play or how I'm going to bowl to this person. But when I get home, I'm just going to be Ben, the the dad to my two lovely kids. I don't know if he's got kids or husband or, or son or whatever that is. Do you think that is maybe a challenge with social media and how intrusive that can be and stuff where players are finding that dif more difficult than they used to? Definitely. I mean, I don't know, you know, Ben Stokes' situation, but you, everything you said there, we, we all know people or have experienced it ourselves where that's absolutely true. Um, that actually recognizing that, you know, we're all, we all play different roles and no role is more important than another. Society tells us that the roles that create wealth and status are the most important. But I think most people reflect through their lives and they go, well, actually, my experience is not always the same as that. Actually, what matters most to me is not what necessarily what society um, tells me it should be. And therefore, the roles that he plays as, yeah, as a cricketer, um, you can place overemphasis on that and underemphasize the other roles that, are, uh, that we play in our lives and actually being kind of being a multifaceted person. You know, you think of what we said earlier about a young cricketer needs to have a second skill, third skill, but actually, as I think as a human being, we having different sides to us is important. And, and kind of if we undervalue those other sides and we overvalue this one that's about what you, particularly where your job's involved, then actually it hinders your performance and the, and the more that you kind of let go of this attachment to the need to perform and this sense of attachment to your kind of identity as me the performer and I think the easier it is to perform because there's not so much on it you can just relax and allow your skills to come to the front whereas where there's a sense of need and attachment and tension and clinginess to it well we all know what that the feelings those that creates and we all know that it's much harder to play well when you are experiencing those feelings as we all play better when we feel free and we want to we can express ourselves and it's fun and we can enjoy it um but and we've got a we've uh, but if you so attached to your results it's very hard to feel that so splitting yeah you know, understanding yourself is really important understanding the roles that you you you, you play um, and just putting less on your performance, like, yeah, it feels like a deal on the end, but it really isn't. It doesn't define you as a person. And I think, you know, Stokes has said some really interesting things. Um, you know, he said it to Joffre Arch, you know, because obviously Stokes bowled that over in the 2016 T20 World Cup, which got hit whack for five, four, five, sixes, and they lost it. And he said to Joffre Arch before he bowled the Super over in 2019, what happens now doesn't define you. And that's so important for people to understand that, that short term results do not define who they are who they are um so yeah i think he's got a great deal of insight there but you can't you can't um predict people's you know how they deal with everything that life throws at you and also there's the inner and the outer isn't there so i think the thing you've got control over more is the way that you your relationship to your thinking about stuff and the way that the way your thinking creates the way you feel but there's also more preferable external environments than others and more that are more likely to help a human being flourish you know so you're more likely to be relaxed on holiday than you are um in a hotel room doing 14 days quarantine for the fifth time this year to play you know a, a, a cricket tournament so um i imagine it's been a very hard you know experience for those those international um players um so it's, it's 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 the balance of coaches and managers and administrators have the duty to create the right 
external environment to be able to flourish, but each individual, the way that they create their internal environment with their relationship to their own thinking and their relationship to themselves and their identity is, and the roles they play is the bit that we we can never stop getting better at. Um, and yeah, I don't know specifically about Stokes, but I think it'd be good for anyone to deal with challenge to not get too fixated on the external environment and get more interested in what's going on internally for me that's making this easier or harder. It's interesting. I actually saw an um, interview yesterday with Kobe Bryant. They, they, they flirt around on Twitter quite a lot. And he was talking with a host of some sort of talk around this Black Mamba mentality. Mm-hmm. And then they brought up a quote about um, him talking, saying he listened to the Halloween soundtrack um, over and over and over again because he wanted to be a, a stone cold killer on that evening or whatever it was but what was more interesting for me about it was that he discussed this idea of almost having an alter ego of having black mamba is when i go into training or i go into weight room or go into a game i'm black mamba i'm horrible i'm you know confrontational i'm this i'm that but then when i leave that i'm different and I wonder whether, whether for, you know, your high end athletes or whatever, whether that's a good way to go and being able to separate those two things almost by having an alter ego in terms of when I get on the pitch, I'm going to separate not from me, but I'm going to separate the task from what I am as a, or what I'm going to experience as a person after that. Um, it's yeah it was really interesting whether that would work or not i don't know but it was just a food for thought from my end really yeah well i think everything that we do you're always an actor playing a role um and you're trying to play that kind of as authentically to, to that comes to you as possible but essentially when he goes and plays kobe bryant the basketball player he's got to work out well, what's going to get the most out of Kobe Bryant, the basketball player, and go and play that role and go and act that out as best as possible. But then those same characteristics are not going to be um, the, the ones that are going to help him in other environments. So it's recognising that I am an actor and here I play this role and here I play that role. Um, and, yeah, trying not to, yeah, being able to put one role down. You know, someone's doing Shakespeare one week and then the next week they're doing um you know they might be in a film and you're going to play a different playing these different roles as best you can but you're not you're not you're not getting your sense of self wrapped up in the role so you know you can drop black man because that's not who he is it's just the role that he plays to the best of his ability on the for that period of time um and yeah i the Kobe Bryant stuff i i don't know a huge amount but i think from the bits i've gathered he did go undergo a bit of a change later in his career so it'd be interesting to know when that interview was from when i think he did become a more selfless player and um so i've you know, seen some other stuff from him which was really um interesting but that just shows that you know people grow up and they go on a bit of a, a journey that, that themselves as well um but yeah you always i think you're always playing a role so you've got to know who you are that's playing the the role and kind of have a bit of fun playing those roles as well like it's not it's not you it doesn't determine you it's just I go out and I play the role of recruit coach and I, this is the way that I feels authentically right to me to play that role but um you know that's not fundamentally who I am and you know in the same in any other sphere you um you walk into and I, I just feel like if you realize you're playing a role and that's um you're trying to do it the best you can, but you're not you're not getting your sense of happiness or self-esteem wrapped up in it because it can't I'm playing a role, that role can't impact me and in, in, in whichever environment. So I'm much more fundamental than that. I'm I I I cannot at a fundamental level I've never changed, you know, the the in the sense that a fifty year old still feels exactly the same person as they were a 10 year old, despite the fact that none of their body is the same as it was, none of their experiences were the same. So what's the bit that is the same? Well, that's 
it's really intangible, isn't it? That's the fundamental. That person is the same, but they've played all these different roles. They played the role of the child. They played the role of the teenager. They're playing the role as the coach, or the role of the athlete. Um, the roles have changed. The body's changed. We all know that you know, we, know, we don't have the, you know, the, the body's continually replacing itself. So the body's changed. The roles have changed. But something at the root of it all is still exactly the same. And that thing is exactly the same whether things have gone well or they've gone badly. Or whether you've, um, you know, yeah, whether you were ten years old or or fifty year olds, and I think that if you can take root in that fundamental sense of yourself and not get caught up in the successes and failures of these different roles we play, then the roles become more fun because it's just more of a, it's, you kind of play in it more. It feels like a game rather than defining yourself by, you know, whether you score runs today or take wickets and so on. Perfect. I think that's a really good uh, point to to end on. So I'm going to ask you one last question, which is something that I ask everyone, which is who's the, I guess for you and your line of work, who's the most impressive individual you've worked with uh, or coached or tutored or whatnot and why? Uh, great, great question. Um, There's no, no big, big, big names. I just think I work in talent development or certainly a lot of the time and just people who understand, who, who really are in it for the kids um, and who understand the graft that takes to run a good talent development section and how that's not, it's not sexy and it's not status and it's not even the fun bit of coaching that they're prepared to graph behind the scenes. And there's just a few guys that I know in cricket. Um, there's a guy called Matt Barnes, who's Oxfordshire, and um, Jason Riles, who works for me at Bucks, and Luke Sharp, who's at North, Northamptonshire. And I just think that everybody, it's not like so many roles. Everybody thinks they want that role, but they don't necessarily understand the graph that is to, to take. And everyone wants the glory moments, but not always prepared to do the work that's hard, which in that sort of role is spreadsheets and schedules and player development plans and all, all that sort of stuff. And I used to have a lot of respect for people that are prepared to do the dirty work and not just try and take the, um, yeah, the, to, to take the achievements or the easy, the easy bits of it. Perfect. And for people that um, are listening that might want to read your book, um, because obviously we spoke about it a little bit. You're giving a great insight into some of the content of it. What's it called? Where can they find it? Where can they go and get it if they are interested? Yeah, it's called Perform, Perform Beyond Pressure. Um, it's on Amazon. And it's essentially distilling down, trying to break down that inner and outer, which we talked about before, um, how we, how much of our understanding of ourselves um, and also our understanding of, of the game and how we can make that so much easier for ourselves and we don't perpetuate myths. I just think when I hear commentators talk about pressure or confidence or um, the demands of the game, we can make that, we can simplify things so much for us and therefore kind of be able to uh, enjoy it a lot more because I just think sometimes we forget that whatever we're doing, we're going to enjoy it first and foremost. Um, but then also kind of understand our unique sort of skill set and um, how we can apply it well to the game and, and strategically, which kind of takes us full circle to what we were talking about at the, at the start of the, um, the conversation or how do we express ourselves, but how do we do that, that smartly um, and, enjoy, and enjoy the results we get. Listen, Rich, really great conversation on loads of different topics and probably haven't gone into half the stuff that you do or have interest in, but really appreciate your time and hopefully you can catch up again soon. No, th thanks for having me, Michael. It's been really good to have such a variety of um, topics to chat about. So, yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.